Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? We'll trace the golden threads they've woven through Oklahoma history. The Red River Institute and Atwoods present Oklahoma Gold. I'm Gwen Falconer Lippert, along with award-winning author and Southern Nazarene University historian John J. Dwyer, we'll dig for the golden nuggets of Oklahoma history here now on Oklahoma Gold. The Wildcatter and His Princess. John J. Dwyer, tell me this story. Well, this story and the people who comprise it reveal one of the most unique, colorful, and ultimately haunting in not just Oklahoma, but American history. The main characters, though, are legendary Oklahoma oil and gas wildcatter and politician E.W. Marland, his stepdaughter Liddy, and his second wife. And to give you a glimpse of the singular nature of this tale, Liddy was Marlin's second wife as well. But more on that later. Now don't, don't cheat. Don't peek ahead. First, let's go back to late 1800s Pennsylvania. Ernest Whitworth Marlin was born and reared there, like fellow Sooner Oil genius Tom Slick. And that's right, that's a real name, Tom Slick. And by the way, we'll explore both of these larger-than-life Oklahoma legends in Volume 2 of the Oklahomans. But by 30 years of age, Marlin had parlayed his intelligence, energy, self-study of geology, and winsome powers of persuasion into a financial fortune in the oil boom environs of western Pennsylvania. But this major figure of Oklahoma history was about to lose his fortune, and not for the only time. The Panic of 1907 National Economic Depression destroyed Marlin's first fortune, but not his business, geological, and deal-making brilliance. The next year, he came to Oklahoma, and like so many others from so many places, he was looking for a second, or third, or even last chance in the state that proved to be America's final frontier, according to great historian Frederick Jackson Turner. A relative introduced him to the daring Miller brothers of the 101 Ranch, the largest diversified ranch and farm outfit in America. The Miller's property stretched across northern Oklahoma through Washington, Payne, and Kay counties. They lay west and northwest of such established oil fields as Bartlesville and Tulsa area Glen Pool. Marlin studied them in depth and decided their surface geology indicated oil. He formed the 101 Ranch Oil Company with the Millers and others. In parlaying his legendary charismatic powers of persuasion, he raised additional financing from business associates back east. Within a couple of years, Marlin had drilled seven holes, all dry. That financing provided for only one more attempt. Amazingly, just like the aforementioned Tom Slick, Marlin struck Bonanza on his final try and thus launched what Oklahoma historian Gaston Litton called, quote, a 20-year tale of empire building in the United States and Mexico, end quote. Marlin perceived that his company's most profitable course lay in natural gas production. He expanded drilling operations into Texas, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, Wyoming, California, and even Mexico. By 1920, his fortune totaled a billion dollars in equivalent 2020's currency. But that was only the beginning. Drawing on the experience and lessons he'd learned back in Pennsylvania, including his close observance of massive Standard Oil's success formula, Marlin also recognized the need to construct an integrated energy enterprise that encompassed exploration, drilling, production, storage, transportation, refining, and retailing. By building that full-orbed operation by 1921, he had liquidated 101 Ranch Oil and consolidated those operations to form Marland Oils, which featured a distinctive triangular red sign. He based it in Ponca City, where his major refinery resided. Marlin pressed forward his comprehensive strategy by purchasing numerous smaller oil companies and shrewdly retaining their most talented executives for his own organization, in effect building an all-star oil and gas dynamo. He also built a network of 600 gasoline filling stations across 11 states and a distribution chain for his products in 17 states 
in 11 foreign countries. The colossal J.P. Morgan companies in New York City financed a growing portion of these endeavors, which rose to 1.3 billion barrels of oil production. As you may have noticed, Gwen, there are a lot of billions involved in telling the E.W. Marlin story. And by 1926, Marlin controlled 10% of the entire world's oil supply. His breathtaking business and energy feats, though, only capture part of Marlin's essence. His creative imagination further evidenced itself, along with his generosity, in a monumental paying back to the city, state, and people amidst whom he had won fame and fortune. He built churches, hospitals, schools, youth centers, city parks, civic improvements, and lots more. Historian Bobby Weaver chronicled how he also provided Marlin Oil's employees with unprecedented perks, such as quality company housing, free insurance, unusually high wages, and the best benefits and working conditions in Oklahoma, including at a company hospital, technical school, and golf course, all of which he built. Yet the flamboyance that helped fuel Marlin's success spawned an increasing indebtedness to the more conservative aforementioned J.P. Morgan. In 1928, an oversupply of oil, insupportable debt, and Marlin's lack of corporate financial frugality prompted J.P. Morgan's stunning overthrow of him. Yes, even very big men can get fired. Marlin Oils was subsumed into Continental Resources, which grew to fame as Conoco. Morgan offered Marlin a toothless position and fat salary if he left Ponca City, but the deposed titan refused, as both his power and second fortune evaporated by 1930 on the heels of the historic 1929 Wall Street stock market crash. It was one of the most dramatic reversals of commercial and financial success in Oklahoma history. And when we come back for the second part of this Oklahoma Gold on the Wildcatter and his princess, we're going to talk about her. We're also going to look at just how E.W. Marlin, Oklahoma legend, responded to this stunning reversal of fortune, and in fact, in his case, stunning reversal of his second fortune. He lost his money twice. How did he overcome this? You're right. Most of us don't make a fortune to begin with. If we do and we lose it, we certainly don't make another one. And then who's lost two fortunes in the billions that we're talking about, as E.W. Marlin did? Well, indeed, he did respond and talk about getting back up off the mat by exhibiting the classic pioneer spirit that forged his legend and this state. He rose up, Gwen, two years later in 1932, shucked the Republican Party allegiance he shared with the Eastern financiers he now loathed, and believe it or not, won election to Congress as the first ever Democrat from Northern Oklahoma's 8th District. So he may have gone from the richest man in Oklahoma history to the poorest man ever to go to Congress from Oklahoma. And he went to Washington. Wow, that's Oklahoma gold. I wonder what the golden nugget will be with this. Maybe real gold. The Wildcatter and His Princess. John J. Dwyer, how many princesses did he have? Don't worry, Gwen, we're going to have our golden nugget like we always do, and you'll find out. But you're right, the Wildcatter, E.W. Marlin, as we talked about a moment ago, became probably the most, uh, the wealthiest Oklahoma in history, at least at that point, lost two fortunes and then went to Congress in the midst of the Great Depression. And in fact, as the twin horrors of the Great Depression and Dust Bowl, all at the same time in Oklahoma, as well as tractored out farm fields across the state, as all that reached their devastating zenith in 1934, Marlin campaigned statewide for governor on a platform of bringing the New Deal to Oklahoma. That's right, he's already a congressman, now he's running for governor. The New Deal was liberal Democratic President Franklin Roosevelt's comprehensive federal program that aimed to leverage the government's resources in a far more aggressive manner than ever before into pumping life back into the struggling American economy. Well, Oklahoma's little New Deal played well at first, 
It swept Marlin into office in a landslide, in, into office in the governor's house. But when the more conservative legislature and general public realized how much money his grandiose notions for rescuing the state from economic calamity would cost, and that little of it actually had tax revenues to pay for it, again, remember, we're in the depths of the Great Depression and Dust Bowl, well, they turned away, and he lost popularity. Marlin's little new deal proved to be somewhat exactly that, and the questionable judgment he frequently exhibited short-circuited his electrifying political career. He lost one bid for the United States Senate that he brazenly engineered right in the middle of his gubernatorial term in 1936. He lost another run for the Senate in 1938, two years later, during the final year of his term-limited four-year gubernatorial stint, and then he lost a subsequent 1940 run for his old congressional seat. But despite Marlin's failure to imbue the state with Roosevelt's New Deal, he did have major political triumphs. These included establishing the Oklahoma Department of Public Safety and its now legendary Highway Patrol, a pension system for the elderly, a hydroelectric dam on the Grand River, the Red River Denison Dam, and helping birth the Interstate Oil Compact Commission, which is just right down the street from the state capitol and the Oklahoma History Center even today. Now, Gwen, I know you love the golden threads of Oklahoma history, which connect the past to the present. Before we get to tonight's golden nugget, let's look at, at the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, at one of the most memorable golden threads. If not E.W. Marlin's most enduring legacy, certainly as most visible is the 40-foot-high Pioneer Woman statue in Ponca City. In 1926, he launched a nationwide competition among America's greatest sculptors to honor, in the words chiseled into the monument's large stone base, the heroic character of the women who braved the dangers and endured the hardships incident to the daily life of the pioneer and homesteader in this country. In trying to symbolize the pioneer woman of America, wrote English-born sculptor Bryant Baker, who won the epic five-year contest, he identified the statue's book as the Bible. The Bible, Bryant said, was a vital factor in building up this country, and it often was the one indispensable book, recording the facts of the family life, of births, marriages, and death, and often the only reading material available for mothers to teach their children to read and write in those days. Will Rogers dedicated it, and President Herbert Hoover and Oklahoma Secretary of War for the United States, Patrick Hurley, beamed in on radio. The Pioneer Woman Statue. Well, Gwen, if the famed Pioneer Woman Statue proved Marlin's most memorable legacy, beautiful Liddy Roberts Marlin remains perhaps his most haunting. Marlin and his wife, his first wife, Mary, sired no children of their own. They adopted their nephew George and niece Liddy as children. Marlin lavished love, gifts, and comforts on both. After Mary died in 1926, Marlin quietly annulled his guardianship of Liddy. He married her in 1928, while age 54, and she was 28. They'd barely moved into his great Ponca City mansion, though, which we know still now as the Palace on the Plains when the loss of Marlin oil and financial ruin forced them into a nearby structure that was built for servants. After his 1941 death, that of E.W. Marlin, Liddy lived for some years in a small cottage built for workmen, the only property the Marlins still retained. Then she simply disappeared for over two decades, periodically cited at such as a 1967 anti-Vietnam War protest in New York City. She returned to Ponca City as unannounced as she had departed sometime in the 1980s. Oklahoma City business leader and philanthropist Richard Anderson, a Conoco executive, recalled what happened. A local attorney discovered where Liddy was living and coaxed her back to Ponca City. She was now a recluse, her beauty was gone, and she was very unkempt. And in a very sad golden nugget, I think, tonight, Gwen, we recall that Liddy Roberts Marlin lived out the final decade of her life in that cottage. She died at age 87 in 1987. Only six people came to the funeral of a mysterious woman whom one biographer christened the Princess of the Palace on the Prairie.
Now that's Oklahoma gold.